so Harsh, you yeah. went into a family business but decided to do something on your own, still connected to the family but mm -hmm. decided to do something on yeah. your own and started this with, you know, at that time the revenues were probably about $75,000 uh, mm -hmm. for the company that you yeah. took on. So first of all, what made you go through the decision of wanting to take something out of the family business? See, I think the business I was in when I joined the business at a very young age, just a commerce graduate, not a postgraduate, I thought that this business was not doing well because it was uh, basically we were in branded, unbranded commodity business. And I said that if I convert that business from unbranded to branded, it will be far more sustainable and profitable. So that insight in terms of converting the business from unbranded to branded was the key reason why we have actually been in business. And I think since then we've been doing whatever we've been doing is in, is in the area of branded business. So tell us about the first brand you created <laughs> and its journey. I think which, the first brand I, I started in India drawing uses. around and which is still our most important brand as of today is the brand Parachute, which is in coconut oil and various now, various other um, um, extensions of coconut-based products. Uh, that was a brand which uh, I started selling in interior markets. I started traveling into interior markets and I realized that up to a point I was able to take it to a 10-15% market share. But when the market share stagnated, we said that we had to do something different because we want to be the market leader. So we said that what can we do? Something which is disruptive in this market. And at that time the whole market was intense. The whole coconut oil market was intense. And we said that if we can actually convert that market from tins to plastics, uh, we will be able to win. Uh, we will create the right to win. But before we developed the product and the packaging, we went to the retailers. And we talked to them and we said that we are coming out in plastics. The retailers said, nothing doing. This is not going to succeed because before you, maybe 10 years before you, somebody else has come in plastics in a square-shaped kind of bottle. Uh, the oil oozing out on top of the surface of the bottle. And when the retailer closes the shop and opens the shop next morning, all the rats are bitten off the bottle and the whole shop is getting spoiled. So there was a huge resistance from the trade that we will not store coconut oil in plastics. But as entrepreneurs, if you are convinced, you don't give up. You, know, you have to go on trying. So we said that can we actually design a bottle which is a round-shaped bottle where the rats will find it difficult to take a grip. Can we actually ensure that no oil is dripping on the outside surface of the bottle? And we did all that and we actually said that can we now test it out? So we kept those bottles in rat cages for a few days. Luckily, no damage done. We took pictures and with those pictures, we again went back to the trade. We're saying this is what we've done and believe us. So over a period of time, we were able to break resistance and it took almost eight, ten years for us to convert the whole market from tin to plastics. And at one level, very simple disruption. But what innovation requires a lot of execution. So every month I would basically go on tracking what is the contribution of plastics and we became a clear market leader with a 50% market share over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And then come winter, the coconut oil freezes. So people would again go back to tin. So we had to develop a wide mouth plastic container with a spout. As the product started getting popular, there were a lot of cop copycats, you know, a lot of lookalikes. So we said that how do we how do we ensure that we don't lose out to those lookalikes? So we went to a mold maker in, in Europe and we said that, can you develop a mold which is, or a package which is difficult to copy? So we came back with a mold which is a combination of pilfer proof and flip top, a mold costing about two crores at that time. And we actually made that bottle. And it was difficult for others to copy because of the capital cost and the fact that we were sourcing the mold from somewhere from outside India. And again, we ensured that all the copycats vanished. So I must say it was a matter of time. The Indian mold makers were able to make the mold at a fraction of a cost. But I think what I'm trying to say is for a brand or for any business to succeed, you need continuous set of innovations. You just can't rest. Yeah. And innovations are very, very critical to any business to succeed. And also there is a, you know, a move toward making micro packets, small packets, yes. because I've seen, you know, smaller packets that come yes. so people may, like the shampoo sachets yeah, kind yeah, of stuff yeah. you guys have done. Yeah. Now, do you think of when you, you know, tin is also not recyclable, neither is plastic. So what do you think of what happens to the bottle after it is after used? After it's used? I think a lot of uh, HDP, what we make in it gets recycled and it's used for something else. So it's mm -hmm. not, it doesn't clog the 
environment, most of it in India at least get, gets recycled. Or some of the people use it for something else also at home. Yeah. So but sachets, as you're calling that, causes a lot of environmental issues. And we, are, we have some sachets, but it's very insignificant compared to our overall sales. So basically, if it's a bottle, you can clean it and use it for something else. Or you can melt, it, melt the thing again, make some, some you know, plastic uh, uh, utensils and things like that. Okay. Yeah. So it's not just, uh, you know, coconut oil. You've also brought an Indian nest to a very Western uh, <laughs> breakfast cereal. So how did that come about? See, we have a brand which is Safola, which is positioned as good for the heart. And um, we said that oats is good for the hearts as a heart food. So can we enter the breakfast segment through the brand Safola? And we did that. We just had plain oats. And when we entered the market, we realized that Indians like savory breakfast. They don't like sweet breakfast. So we said that if we could do to oats what is done to noodles, uh, come up with a range of savory oats, which is masala oats, tomato oats, pepper oats, we should be able to win in the marketplace. And we pioneered that about three years back, and we have become a market leader in that. But I think the key reason why this happened was the insight that Indians like savory breakfast. Yeah. And we took an example of what happened to noodles and, and did it in oats, and I think that segment is going very, very fast, and I think it has helped us getting the market leadership. The, talking about Safola, yeah. so the next question is about when there is a brand, there's a responsibility of the brand also. Yeah. You know, you didn't look at Safola just as an oil, but you've extended it to health. So tell us what is the whole ecosystem you built around health? See, I think it's very important that any brand or every brand has a purpose behind it. It cannot just be a brand where you sell it something to people and then... So what we have tried to do for Safola is to actually create a brand which stands for heart care. So towards that, we do a lot of initiatives. We for, formed a Safola Heart Healthy Heart Foundation, wherein we take free cholesterol checkups. We educate people to walk, to give up habits like smoking. So overall, how do you improve the awareness? How do you create the awareness to lead the right lifestyle? Yeah. So if we can actually play that role, then it will help the brand indirectly. Mm -hmm. You actually talk in business about what business should you be in, what, what business should you not be in. Mm. There's an interesting phrase you use and you actually used it to decide your positioning yeah, in the shampoo yeah, market. Yeah. So tell us about your phrase. So I think what we say is every organization has to have a right to win because the overall competitive environment is in the country is increasing and you need to create that right to win to succeed in the marketplace. It could be a segment you're pioneering, it could be something innovative, it could be the best service you're providing, or it could be leveraging a set of competencies you have which is better than any other competitor, or it could be selection of a market, geographical market where others are not present. So basically, organizations have to find the right to win. If they find the right to, wi right to win and enter the right category, then the chances of success and sustained success will be much, much higher. So how did you use that in the shampoo market? So we are uh, clear that we are not present in shampoo market. We got an opportunity to buy a shampoo brand, which is a niche brand. It's a small brand, which stands for anti life Shampoo Medicare. So we acquired that brand and we have market leadership in that because it's too small for the big com companies to get into. And when we actually bought the brand, the key insight we had was that the penetration of or the usage of oils was much higher than the usage of shampoos in India. And if we develop the same anti lice product in an oil format, our sales will increase. So after acquiring the brand from Procter & Gamble, we developed the Medicare oil. And within one year, our sales just doubled. So, so that's all about business and how, you know, you've created yeah. a, uh, you know, successful position in business. Now, when you become a big business, now, you know, you are a billion, almost a billion dollar business, which is mm. 6,500 crores there's a certain hierarchy that sets in. Mm -hmm. So if you want new ideas, yeah. how do you create an environment for a new idea in a large business? Yeah, I'm a strong believer of culture because a culture is a source of competitive advantage. And you need to create a culture which will make you win in the marketplace. So I think you need to identify what kind of culture you require and what is the key competency you require to win in the marketplace. In our case, innovation is very important. So how can you create a culture of innovation? 
So you have to select a diverse set of people who have, who are intelligent, create a culture which is very open, share a lot of information where we encourage dialogues, encourage risk-taking, experimentation, ensure that if there are failures, they're not punished. So if you create that culture where there are a lot of experimentation taking place, they are not afraid of failing, then you will have more and more experiments taking place and that's how innovation will flourish in the organization. Actually, you did pull someone out of your organization, had them report directly mm. to you, mm. which led to yeah. creating the Kaya business. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. See, I, uh, at that time we were, uh, I used to get many ideas for starting a new business and every, every time I would get an idea, I would go to somebody existing in my setup, say a marketing head, and say that let's evaluate this new business. And invariably, it would just not get the right attention because they had their own job to do. So, I, it was very frustrating for me. So, I said, what do we do to actually ensure that we get into new businesses? And we said that, can we make a structural change? So, towards that, I removed one of the group product managers. And he's, I said that he should report to me directly. And his job is only going to be evaluating new businesses. So, remove the escape buttons of uh, existing responsibility and only evaluate new businesses. The other thing I made it very clear at that time was that we will not go through all the trappings of a corporate world, which is all the processes, approvals, because I will behave like a small entrepreneur with him. So, I was behaving like a very small entrepreneur in a large company. Um, and that's how I started getting ideas. One of the ideas came from a friend of mine who's based out of USA, and he said that I am making laser hair removal machines, and let's start this in India. I did some quick and dirty market research, realized, yes, there was a scope for laser hair removal machines in India, but that itself was not very exciting because I think I like businesses which are difficult to copy. So I told him that I want to get into skincare rather than just laser hair removal. So he took me to London, to New York to see some dermatologists and when I came back, I realized that indeed there was an opportunity of creating a business because India, the cost of dermatologists is much lower than in the developed countries. Yeah. So within a very short period of time, we imported machines and we went into business within one and a half years. And the key reason was because we removed those escape buttons and I was actually handling that as an entrepreneur in a large organization and moved very fast. Within one and a half years, we were in this business. Yeah. You know, uh, the last question I want to ask you is about building a culture. You yeah. touched on it, building yeah. a governance. Now, in your company, I mean, it is, uh, you are the promoter as well as the CEO, as well as the chairman, and, but you decided to leave earlier than you were supposed to leave because you pretty much can decide when you want to leave. Yeah. But you decided to step down early and you decided to bring a professional to run the company, somebody who's been with you. Yeah. Yeah. So why did you decide to step down earlier than you were expected to? See, I think uh, every promoter or any... CEO has to always ask a question, what is good for the company comes first. You'll always have a dilemma, what is good for the company, what is good for me as a promoter. So if you answer that question, what is good for the company comes first, then you take a logical decision. In this case, I had not thought of retiring or not. I didn't retire, but I just stepped down as managing director. I am still the chairman. But I think I decided because it was good for the company. What thought would you like to leave? Uh, here where there's a lot of entrepreneurs who are starting companies now, etc. Uh, do you wait till you become big and then worry about the governance? What are your thoughts on governance? No, I think I have been a strong proponent of governance ever since you were very small. And I think it's very important that even if you're small, you have to set the right example in terms of governance. So whether it is uh, following the laws or tax evasion or whatever you're doing, if you have the right governance, you'll be able to, able to attract right talent, right associates. If you go public, you will get better valuations. So it's very, very important for entrepreneurs to realize that governance plays a very, very important role, irrespective of the size of the business. So what would you, what would be your last thought that you would like to share with everybody? I think the last thing I would like to say is that organizations have a purpose because you have created an organization, not, not just for shareholders, but for all the stakeholders. So whether it's your employees or whether it's your customers or whether it's the society or your key associates, you have to make that difference. You have to go that extra mile. 
in making that difference. Yeah. And uh, there is a whole separate conversation we can have about all the things you're doing now to support the entrepreneurs, but people have to come back for a separate interview. Yeah. Thank you so Thank you. much Thank for you. being here, Harsh. <laughs>